Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ryan and this is my teammate Jonathan and together we'll be presenting our project on antimicrobial plastic for 3D printing of food safe items. Our other two teammates, Alex and Kojo, are outside of our poster, although Alex is going to try to join us for the question period. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a special thanks to our consultant, Dr. Nasser Abukadir, for his uh, expertise and guidance over the course of the project. We're going to start off by going over the motivation for this project and the requirements that those motivations led to. We're then going to talk about our design in a high-level overview before we go into a little more detail about the design process itself. Finally, we're going to conclude by going over our validation results. The 3D printing industry is rapidly expanding, and one of the more emerging markets in this sex sector is the home use and the hobbyist use. More and more people are being able to afford 3D printers of their own or being able to buy the parts and put them together from a kit. And this is the market that we want to target with our, uh, with our device. One of the problems at 3D printing that has not been solved uh, to this point in time is that the layer by layer deposition process involved in building a 3D printed part leads to all sorts of microvoids and striations uh, within the material. These striations act as a haven for bacterial growth, which are very impossible to clean after the fact. Uh, obviously, this bacterial growth promotes or uh, leads to a huge food safety issue, especially for repeated use. So because of this, we determined that we have six focal requirements for our material in order to address. We determined that we need to have at least a 50% reduction in, bac in uh, uh, bac bacterial activity. The plastic that we use needs to be food compatible, ideally FDA food compatible. It needs to be thermally stable at least at 80 degrees Celsius so as to withstand the environment of a dishwasher. It needs to have the same mechanical properties uh, as the uh, base, HD, base plastic that we use within 10% deviation. There needs to be no post-processing to make this material easy to use. And uh, most importantly, it needs to be 3D printable. We started off by looking at a couple of different solutions that we could uh, use to achieve this effect. Obviously, un the untreated material will lead to bacterial growth. One of the solutions that has been proposed by other people is to actually mechanically or thermally reflow the surface of the material to eliminate those striations entirely. This wasn't a good solution to us because you need to do the work yourself after you print the part. And if you have any kind of intricate geometry on the part, it's effectively impossible to polish it out and eliminate all of those striations. Another technique that some researchers have done is invented some chemical treatments that you would paint on or spray onto the exterior of the part. This also wasn't a good solution to us because although this may be antimicrobial, they're generally very delicate. Any mechanical damage to the part is going to take that surface coating right off and you're back where you started with a food safety issue. For that reason, our solution is to incorporate our active material directly into the bulk. So it's, it requires no extra action on behalf of the user. They simply print using our material and the antimicrobial functionality comes right out of the box. With that in mind, we put together a high-level overview of what we wanted to achieve with this product. We would develop an antimicrobial material and embed it within a polymer matrix. We would then extrude this polymer into a filament suitable for use with 3D printers and verify this functionality by running it through our own 3D printer and performing uh, antimicrobial and mechanical tests on the finished product. Step one was to choose a plastic. We started by looking at all of the commonly used food plastics as well as all, all the commonly used 3D printing plastics. It was easy to eliminate all the ones that are known to be toxic or have a public perception of being toxic. Next we eliminated PLA because although it is very environmentally friendly and biodegradable, it's too biodegradable for this application. The elevated temperatures and the moist environment involved in dishwashing in particular would definitely uh, destroy the integrity of the product. We eliminated polypropylene because we couldn't find any results of somebody having successfully 3D printed it. Of the three remaining materials, we chose HDPE because it is the most commonly used and for uh, applications where you need to use the item more than once. And compared to LDP, which is almost identical chemically, uh, it has much better mechanical properties. 
So then we needed to determine which antimicrobial agents we would have used. It would have been either organics or inorganics. However, we immediately eliminated organics from our decision, ma our organics from our decision matrix because they would not be able to withstand the uh, environment from our 3D printer. Then from inorganics, we had determined that uh, silver nanoparticles present the most attractive characteristics for the scope of our project. Uh, and then we needed to figure out how we're going to integrate the antimicrobial agent into our material. So the silver nanoparticles, they need to be stable. They need to, be, uh, they need to not aggregate too much because you need to have uniform size in order to maintain the uh, antimicrobial functionality. Uh, the, 3D nano, or the silver nanoparticles need to be compatible with the HDPE. And then both together, the matrix needs to be 3D printing friendly. So we determined that we need to incorporate them, or the way that we would incorporate them would have been in one of three different ways, either through bulk polymerization. However, we decided that that would not have been a good process because we didn't want to experiment with the polymerization of HDPE or melt mixing, uh, or, or we could have done melt mixing. Uh, however, we couldn't get access to this system. And then we could have done solvent casting, and that's what we had chosen because it's a good intermediate process. Having determined how we would create our material, our next step was to determine how we would extrude and 3D print it. Because we have such a low batch size, um, a lot of commercial options weren't available to us and we really wanted to keep costs low. For this reason, uh, we obtained a filament extruder built from a DIY kit and constructed it ourselves. Fortunately, our advisor already had access to a 3D printer which we were able to use for the duration of the project. Okay. So, uh, we tried to synthesize the silver nanoparticles in two different methods. The first one was an aqueous solution, which was uh, a failed attempt. Uh, the way that we would have done this was we uh, synthesize the silver nanoparticles in aqueous solution, and then we do a ligand transfer to transfer them from aqueous into the organic phase to make them compatible with our HDPE. This could have been done either through dodecanthiol or the introduction of PVA co-HDPE block copolymers. However, we found that the main issues with this particular method was that we had high polydispersity and large nanoparticle sizes, which uh, detracted from the antimicrobial functionality. We also found that it was extremely difficult to perform the ligand exchange because it had extremely uh, precise uh, ingredients or recipes. So then we determined that the best way to go was to avoid the ligand exchange and perform an organic phase reaction altogether. Uh, for this, uh, after we did the reaction, we performed a UV vis spectrum and we found that we had a characteristic peak at 430 nanometers, which is uh, correspondent to that of a 10 nanometer size nanoparticle, uh, which is the size that we had been hoping for, or the range in which we had been hoping for. Uh, the issue with this particular uh, mechanism was that it had low yields. However, we managed to increase the yield by increasing the size of our reaction chamber. So that was that. Uh, this is an SEM photo of uh, comparing our HDP to the AGHDP polymer that we had created. Uh, the white dots in the AGHDPE uh, correspond to the silver nanoparticles that were implemented or integrated into the system. There are, there's a bit of aggregation, which we will talk about a little bit later. Having successfully fabricated our material, the next step was to extrude it. We started with extruding just commercially obtained ABS pellets because we had ABS, which is a, a common 3D printing filament, on hand, and that way we could directly compare the results to a commercial filament. Having done that, we proceeded to HDPE and our silver HDPE composite, which you can see here. So this is our HDPE filament, which we uh, extruded through the filament extruder, and right here is our active material. Switching from ABS to HDPE introduces a couple of design challenge. One of them was the weight feedback, because the diameter of the filament is, de is dependent upon the temperature of that filament that has been extruded. Sorry, not the temperature, on the weight. So if it gets heavier, it puts more tension on it, it gets thinner, and there's a feedback system inherent in that. Another problem was any kind of air movement in the room would affect the cooling of the material and lead to warping. We fixed both these problems by extruding at an elevated height so that uh, the average weight of the filaments over the uh, length of the drop was averaged out. And also, we enclosed the system so to isolate it from air currents. With both these fixes in place, we were able to consistently extrude filament that was 2.34 millimeters in diameter, uh, which fits comfortably in a 3 millimeter 3D printer. 
there was only a 0 0.1 millimeter diameter deviation and we obtained a 0 0.03 millimeter roundness as measured by the difference between the uh, primary and secondary axes of the filaments, which is on par with uh, commercial quality filaments. Having extruded our filament, we then fed it through the 3D printer. Uh, this material has similar challenges as ABS for 3D printing, which is uh, an elevated thermal expansion coefficient as well as a high heat capacity. If you cool your part at uneven rates, this can lead to thermal stresses within the material, which can cause it to bend off the substrate, uh, as you can see from our very first low quality print there. We were able to address these problems by removing the fans uh, using a heated build plate and uh, putting an enclosure around it to control the cooling rate, as well as replacing the glass build plate with, uh, with a polystyrene material to increase adhesion. And you can see that our final print quality is uh, very high. So now that we managed to 3D print, it's time to check for the actual antimicrobial properties. So we performed an ISO 22196 test, which is the standard for testing the antimicrobial functionality of plastics. Uh, on the bottom, you see our, uh, the control polymer uh, and our AGHDPE. Uh, and then on the right, you see the actual performance. Um, as you can see, the, there's a significant reduction in the AGHDPE. Specifically, it's a 97% reduction in bacterial activity after only first iteration. So we can imagine that it'll increase further with later uh, optimizations. This is a depiction of uh, the test that we had performed. It's important to note here that the number of colonies is important as opposed to the size. Uh, because that tells you the number of viable bacteria. So this just shows the decrease uh, in bacterial function or bacterial growth with our uh, polymer. And then we also mentioned that it's important for us to have the same mechanical properties uh, within reason compared to the base polymer that we were using. So for this, we performed mechanical tests and melting tests using the DSC and tensile testing. And we found that there's a less than 1% deviation in uh, tensile strength. And the uh, melting temperature was the same as that of the uh, HDPE, which means that this, sub or this substance can be uh, handled in the same way as you would use a regular H uh, HDPE. Looking at a cost breakdown of our material, it's not surprising to find that the majority of the cost comes from the silver nanoparticles themselves, as our base material HDPE is incredibly inexpensive. As it is right now, our material costs are approximately $70 per kilogram, which puts us uh, in the ballpark of other functional filaments on the market right now. The exciting thing about this is that uh, because our filament is made up largely of silver and literature has shown that we should be able to obtain the same antimicrobial activity with a 10 times reduction in the silver concentration, that will translate directly into a price saving and we should be able to produce the material such that it can be sold at about $30 per kilogram in line with uh, the standard 3D pil printing filament. So we can price this very competitively. Furthermore, addition of the silver to our material does not impact the recyclability of the HDPE, which is one of the prime draws of the material in the first place. Because uh, local recycling plants use a sink float separation technology to separate additives from the plastic. Our silver nanoparticles are compatible with this system and we should be able to uh, recycle our material just like any other HDPE product. And this means that there's a, a low material cost and a very energy efficient uh, fabrication procedure to get more HDPE. Returning to our device requirements, we had targeted a 50% reduction in activity, which we were able to far surpass with a 97% reduction. Our plastic is both food compatible and thermally stable above 80 degrees Celsius through the use of HDPE as our main material. We have much less than a 10% uh, deviation in mechanical and thermal properties, uh, and in fact are far under 1%. We were able to come up with a solution that requires no post-processing through the incorporation of the nanoparticles into the bulk material. And finally, we were able to show that we can successfully print this material at high quality. In conclusion, we've successfully designed and verified an antimicrobial and food safe 3D printing pl plastic, empowering everyday creators to safely invent food contact items with peace of mind.
We'd like to thank the following people for their help during the project, uh, both for advice and for providing the lab facilities necessary to complete this project. Any questions? Yes. yes. So the antimicrobial activity actually comes from the silver ions, which are able to diffuse out through the material. The exact mechanism through which the silver ions have antimicrobial activity hasn't been, it's being studied right now, it's not fully understood, but uh, this antimicrobial activity in the plastic has been verified in similar systems, and we were able to re-verify it through our antimicrobial testing. The nanoparticles themselves do not leave the plastic. Yes. 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 So. So, so you know, any any application of this this kind of fluid? So we actually, uh, this was a, a question that we were concerned about ourselves. So we thoroughly researched the toxicology data on silver nanoparticles and silver ions in particular. And uh, we found several research papers that had looked into this area. And we found that uh, after you do all the calculations uh, and account for the uh, uncertainty factor going from animal testing to human testing, et cetera, we calculated 12.5 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. Our simulations put us far under this value. However, we plan on carrying out leaching experiments with a food simulant so we can verify exactly how much uh, silver is actually leaching out. So while we don't expect, uh, based on our simulations, to come anywhere near this value, uh, we haven't completed that testing as of yet. So on a related question, is this, is this plastic porous, or is it only the nanowires on or near the surface that are? No, so the, they're able to actually diffuse through the bulk plastic. The plastic itself, uh, isn't porous, and as we've shown with the mechanical testing data, I think the nanoparticles did not actually uh, affect the, the polymer properties. So, and so silver ions can dissolve through the plastic? Yes, yeah, they can dissolve through this matrix. How do you know? Well, we know because of the measured antimicrobial activity, they have to be getting out there somewhere. And actually, the researchers who came before us and pioneered the science, which this project was based on, were worried about the same question. And what they actually did was, after creating their material, they basically dip coated it in a layer of just pure HTPE to ensure that it was impossible that any silver nanoparticles were exposed to the exterior. And they measured the same antimicrobial effects, thus verifying that they were diffusing out through the polymer. That's an interesting question. So the way the FDA works is we found there wasn't a formal test, as in you have to pass this and now your food is OK. And Health Canada is even worse. But what they do have is they have a database of acceptable polymers. So the silver embedded particles aren't in there. What we would need to do to get this FDA approved is one, that antimicrobial test that we'd need to do to be able to say that our product is antimicrobial. And we have met the requirements of that test, which is surprisingly low. All you have to do is demonstrate statistical antimicrobial activity, even if it's 1%, which is effectively completely useless. The other test you'd have to do is that leaching test. So if you can say that my material is safe as it is, and it's not even leaching out of the plastic, and our plastic is already on that list of FDA-approved plastics, if we can meet those two factors, then that would be a strong case for the FDA approval. Not at all. So the only test that's, the only part of this project that is really inconclusive at this point is that leaching test that we still need to carry out. We could also optimize the actual antimicrobial property by, uh, I guess, doing different loading percentages of the silver nanoparticles. Thank you.